Hello and welcome to today's seminar on models of innovation education in South Asia. I am Sanjay Kumar, the India Country Director of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University. The mission of the Institute is to engage through interdisciplinary research to advance and deepen the understanding of critical issues relevant to South Asia and its relationship with the world. As part of this engagement, the Mittal Institute hosts a multitude of events covering topics in the arts, humanities, sciences, education, business, and more. We are so glad you joined us today and please consider joining us for our upcoming seminars. A couple of housekeeping items for today. Today's session will be recorded. During the question and answer session, you can submit questions directly to moderators via the Q&A function on Zoom. Due to the large number of attendees at today's seminar, we unfortunately will not be able to cover all questions. There will be a short survey automatically sent to you at the end of the session. We would ask that you kindly fill this out. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the moderator of today's session, Professor Emrick Davis. Emrick Davis is an assistant professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, a faculty associate at the Vedashit Center for International Affairs and Center for International Development, and a co-convener of the Brown Harvard MIT joint seminar on South Asian politics. Emrick Davis specializes in education policy and politics, the political economy of development, and the politics of service provision, with a regional focus on South Asia. His dissertation, for which he was awarded the National Academy of Education Spencer Dissertation Fellowship, examines the growth of private elementary education in India and the consequences of using private rather than public schools on individuals' beliefs and civic engagement. Thank you for being with us today, Amrik. Handing over to you. Thank you, Sanjay, for that introduction and uh, for bringing us all together. Um, thank you all of you in the audience for joining us this evening or wherever you may be in the world. Um, as Sanjay said, my name is Emmerich Davies um, and I am an assistant professor ed of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, um, where most of my work is focused on education in South Asia. So as a result, I'm very excited to be moderating this panel today on models of innovation um, in education in South Asia. Um, we have organizations that represent four of the countries from SARC, um, the Orenda Project from Pakistan, um, the America India Foundation from India, Katha from Nepal, from Nepal um, and the Bangladesh Youth Learning Center. Um, we are going to begin with short videos from four of um, from the four organizations. Um, and before we started the webinar, uh, we were discussing backstage um, that it's really nice to be able to have this opportunity to learn from other organizations from within South Asia, um, where normally uh, most of our lessons come from outside of the South Asian context. Um, before we um, start with the videos, I wanted to introduce um, the four organizations and the four participants that you will be hearing for, from um, in greater detail in just a second. So um, from the Orenda Project, we have um, Harun Yassin, uh, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Urenda Project, um, an educational tech company that creates content for children. Harun is a teacher and educational entrepreneur in Pakistan, um, and he founded the Urenda Project in 2015 to provide high-quality, engaging education to every child. Um, Urenda digitized Pakistan's national curriculum and developed Talimabad, which you're going to hear about a, a little bit more in just a second, a mobile and web application that helps out-of-school children resume their studies. With his Malala Fund grant, Harun expanded Talimabad curriculum to include secondary education. He trains teachers, community groups, and district officials to use Talimabad and reach even more out-of-school girls. Um, from AIF, we have the CEO of AIF joining us today, Nishant Pandey. Um, in his capacity as CEO, he provides strategic leadership to AIF's operations spanning the US and India. Um, he began as, his career as a banker, um, but thankfully we were able to recover him back to the development sector. Um, he's previously worked at Oxfam as a program officer for South India, um, where he designed and developed value chain programs on the themes of powers in markets um, before moving to uh, Oxfam's global headquarters in Oxford, um, leading program development in 12 countries. Um, and before moving back to India as AIF's country director, um, Nishant was based in Jerusalem where he had uh, one of his most complex and challenging assignments as Oxfam's country director for the occupied uh, Palestinian territories in Israel. 
from Katha for Nepal, we have um, Rumi Singh, uh, who is the founder of uh, Katha for Nepal, uh, a platform for kids to engage and learn through stories, and also for parents to relax and help comfort their kids. Rumi has successfully led and managed education programs, including financial literacy programs featuring Warren Buffett and STEM programs for Intel and Disney. She has also worked with PepsiCo in the global communication team at New York and led uh, sector PepsiCo consumer relations in Dubai before moving back to Nepal. Um, she has a diverse background in corporate communication, journalism, writing, education, and engineering. Um, and finally, uh, from BYLCX, Ayaz Aziz, um, who's the manager of BYLCX um, Online Learning Academy. He is learning, he's leading BYLC's efforts to democratize 21st century skills training for Bangladeshi youth by making meaningful online learning experiences available from anywhere at any time. Ayaz is involved in rethinking youth education and training, engaging experts to develop content, and building a platform to make this content available on a mass scale. Um, I'm going to stop here and without further ado, I want to um, uh, introduce the videos that we will be um, watching before opening up for, uh, for a Q&A. Pakistan exists as a highly stratified society. The kind of social class that you're born into determines the kind of school that you can go to. And in turn, the kind of school that you can go to determines the kind of social class that you're bound to remain in for the rest of your lives. And I've decided to dedicate my life to fighting that. My name is Harun Yaseen, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Arenda, a company that takes the national curriculum of Pakistan and converts it into a highly digitized, animated, and engaging format. And then, using a mobile app, makes over 130,000 children all across the country fall in love with learning. Now, one of the major problems all across Pakistan is that children are dropping out in alarming numbers. And the sole reason for them dropping out in such large numbers is that they've lost their interest in education. Talimabad changes that. By making a very, very engaging curriculum, children in Talimabad come in and they take a lesson through a video. That video is in the form of a cartoon. And then once you watch the cartoon, you take a test. But the test is also in the form of a game. So all in all, in the entire experience, children never feel like they're doing a chore. Every single student, when they open the Alimabad, feel that their favorite teacher has walked into the classroom and is paying exquisite, unique attention to them. Talimabad has now been piloted in government schools all across Pakistan in some of the most underperforming remote schools. And it's been found to reduce dropouts by an overwhelming 70% and improve performances of students by 31%. A few months ago, we heard from a cancer hospital. And the cancer hospital had found out that as soon as children start to have their cancer treatment through chemotherapy, many of them drop out of school. The hospital called us. They made a special room and they put Talimabad in the hospital. When they're done with their treatment and they go back to their schools, their teacher asks them where they've been studying. Because not only have they not gone back in their learning levels, in fact, they've jumped ahead. And I spent a large part of the last eight years traveling to slums and villages all across Pakistan, feeling that education has to change. It must change. Winning the Cisco Youth Leadership Award would mean that this is not only our local battle, that it is a global battle now. I want every underserved child to have the opportunity of world-class education at their fingertips, regardless of the ability to pay, and through technology, that will become affordable and accessible to every single child.
सांग माने समस्त लर्निंग रिसर्च सेंटर रे पढू हमें समस्त मिसी मिली मिसी पढीले हमको बहुत भलो लागे और मजा भी लागे सेथि पई मु सब दिन लर्निंग रिसर्च सेंटर को पढीबा को जाय और किसी सिखीबा को मध्य मिले मु केबे पढा बन करबी नहीं ओ मु पढी गोटिए सिखेत्री हेबी मेरा लड़का जो एल सेंटर में पढ़ते हैं जब से सेंटर में जा रहे हैं तब से पढ़ाई में बहुत उनका उत्साह बढ़ा है और ऐसे ही चलता रहे कि हम लोग हमारे और पीढ़ी जो है वो भी ऐसे पढ़े कभी ये सेंटर बंद ना हो ऐसे आपसे आशा करती हूँ और मैं एआईएफ का धन्यवाद करती हूँ यहाँ पे हर साल लगातार आरसीसी सेंटर हो रहा है और यहाँ के बच्चे बहुत ही बेनिफिटेड हो रहे हैं और ड्रॉप आउट जो है वो जीरो परसेंट हो गया है क्लास वन टू एट कोई भी बच्चे ऐसे नहीं हैं जो कि यहाँ पे ड्रॉप आउट है और उसके साथ साथ हमारे यहाँ के जो दो टीचर्स लैम्प ट्रेनिंग में गए थे बहुत ही अच्छे तरीके से उस लैम्प ट्रेनिंग में जो कुछ भी उनको शिक्षा मिला यहाँ पर बच्चों को सिखाया और उसके सहाय माध्यम से परीक्षा में भी यहाँ के बच्चे अच्छे कर रहे हैं Stories are fantastic learning platforms to capture a young child's attention and to fuel their curiosity and thinking ability. As a mother of two young children, I have always relied on read alouds to bond with my kids and also to introduce them to their imagination and creative potential. The onset of COVID-19 has ended up in school closures and almost no physical interaction for young minds. Stories now have become more important than ever before. Many children in Nepal have limited access to storybooks as they stay home during the pandemic. Katha for Nepal was born in response to these challenges. Our social initiative is a platform for children to hear stories and continue learning at home. I love storytelling. I love to tell stories and especially reading aloud to especially the little ones. Who cannot read by themselves, because with your experience, with, with what you've seen and heard in the world, you can bring it all out as the story demands. It really gets them to think and makes them enjoy storytelling, and it gets ingrained in little brains, and especially in Nepal, where there is a shortage of books per se, leave a let alone library books or whatever. It's really important that we have programs, whether it's online or through the radio, where you can read aloud. We have people from various backgrounds who read children's stories in English, Nepali, and local dialects. The platform has grown and adapted to be community-driven, where a number of enthusiastic storytellers share read-alouds and help reach a wider audience. We have also collaborated with some schools and online learning platforms to conduct interactive storytelling sessions. We recently conducted this session on environment, blood donation. and cleanliness with kids and they were amazingly engaging William wanted a doll he wanted to hug it and cradle it in his arms 
साथी सीत सोधी मेरो नीलो छाता देखियो साथीले भनिन मेरो छाता त सेतो छ At Katha for Nepal we curate content and partner with various publishing houses organizations and influencers to push a diverse range of stories from mental health awareness to sexuality and culture identity based read alouds we are focused on sharing empowering inspiring and educational children stories katha for nepal started in a very broad way to just uh, get students to um, you know read stories and get adults to read stories to students we're now thinking of curating certain books we can plan lesson plans around read alouds we can plan units of study so there's a lot of potential our reactions from parents have also been very warm and encouraging i love to listen to new stories all the time they are so cool i enjoy all the stories from kota for nepal young children in nepal have always had limited access to libraries and books with or without a pandemic instilling a love for books and cultivating a reading culture is key to drive structural changes in our education system katha for nepal is bringing the joy of reading to young children and parents at home one book at a time The challenges facing Bangladesh today are daunting and complex. Taking the country forward requires the support of many hands. In a country where almost half of the population is below the age of 25, Bangladesh Youth Leadership Center believes that the key to developing lasting solutions lies in nurturing a generation of leaders and change makers that will take ownership of the issues faced by their communities. Bivalsi's journey started in 2008 when a Bangladeshi graduate student at Harvard, Ajaz Ahmed, envisioned a leadership program that would unite youth from diverse backgrounds, equip them with leadership skills, and engage them in active citizenship. Within a span of 12 years, BYLC has transformed from a living room project to one of the most trusted, respected, and sought-after youth leadership platforms in Bangladesh. So what are the principles that define BYLT's programs? First, we believe in leadership versus authority. Leadership is a process and not a position. BYLT emphasizes adaptive leadership to find solutions that address core systems instead of quick fixes. Second, we believe in unity and compassion. Effective leadership requires the capacity to embrace diversity and inclusiveness. A cornerstone of BYLT's approach is uniting youth from diverse socioeconomic and educational backgrounds by bringing youth together from the three prevailing but fragmented education streams in Bangladesh: English medium, Bangla medium, and Madrasa, and therefore teaching them how to work as an inclusive team. Third, we believe in skills and competence. Conventional approaches to education based on rote memorization have left our youth with critical skill gaps. By focusing on experiential learning methods, BYLT's programs cultivate critical thinking, teamwork, and communication skills that are not addressed by conventional education. Youth employment is a critical issue in Bangladesh, where more than 10% youth are currently unemployed. To address this challenge, BYLT launched its Office of Professional Development in 2016 to provide career guidance and employability training and engage directly with the private sector to understand and disseminate industry needs. With the mission to democratize leadership education and 21st century skills training, BYLC launched its online academy BYLCX in 2017. BYLCX offers online courses and live online workshops to help learners develop career relevant skills and stay relevant to a workplace that is changing faster than ever before. Given the severity of Bangladesh's youth unemployment, simply finding jobs may not be sufficient enough and it may well become a necessity in the long term to create jobs. With the same vision, BYLC Ventures was created to engage Bangladeshi youth in entrepreneurship through training, mentorship and startup accelerator programs. With Ventures, BYLC has become an important player in Bangladesh's burgeoning startup ecosystem. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us all to adapt to challenging circumstances and face up an uncertain future. Since the nationwide lockdown in March 2020, VULC has moved all its training and engagement activities online and adapted its curriculum for the new normal. In the face of the present difficulties, VULC's mission and vision remain as relevant as ever. To strengthen prosperity, justice, inclusiveness in societies in Bangladesh and around the world. Thank you all for these uh, videos introducing all, all of us to the very good work that you've been doing in, um, in education and innovation in, in education across South Asia uh, before the, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and during. Um, for the next 30 minutes or so, we will have a discussion between all the participants. Um, and right now, I'd like to introduce, uh, introduce the participants from the organizations that we just saw videos from. Um, we have uh, Harun Yasin from the Arenda Project. Um, Nishant Pandey from the America India Foundation, Rumi Singh from Katha for Nepal, um, and Ayaz Aziz from the Bangladesh Youth Learning Center, joining all of us here today. Um, I will have a couple of questions for the participants uh, before opening it up to a more general Q&A um, uh, from the, the audience. So um, without further ado, as we get into the Q&A, um, I wanted to start with the uh, elephant in the room um, and address COVID specifically. Um, the pandemic has shut schools, forced many of us to work remotely um, and changed um, how we all do our work. Uh, for an organization like Arenda, there will be some significant learning losses um, after, after the pandemic. Uh, for programs like uh, like the Learning and Migration Program, um, the Great Migration Crisis that was um, started during COVID has changed residential and school choices um, as migrants return home. For organizations like Katha for Nepal, being homebound has meant strained time and finances uh, for parents to engage program and, and for, for organizations like um, BYLC, the economic contraction from COVID uh, can mean contracted financial opportunities for all participants. Um, just to start off, I'd love to hear from all four panelists, from all of you, how the pandemic has changed how you do your work um, and engage with children and young adults um, across the region. Um, so Haroon, starting with, with you as you were the first video that we saw. Yeah, thanks for having us, Imrik. Um, I think one of the things that we've learned the most uh, during the pandemic is the fact that uh, EdTech had a very different perception in Pakistan before the pandemic struck. I think it was for many parents uh, before the pandemic, we had roughly reached about, and this video is from before the pandemic, we were at 135,000 users. We've now crossed over and are close to 700,000. Um, and I think one of the things that has happened the most is that it, ed tech and, and, and distance learning programs and e-learning programs have turned from a nice to have uh, to a must have for parents. And one of the things that we've seen so far is that uh, our program primarily targets users from tier two and tier three series. Um, and previously, because uh, parents used to be working or because there was only one smartphone in the household, we often used to see Talimabad being used at the most odd times of the day. Uh, sometimes at 11 o'clock at night or, or close to midnight. And we always used to wonder uh, and, and call up the parents and you know, you know, talk to them about the fact that um, that was that was a, a very strange time for their kid to be learning. Um, and one of the things that we've discovered I, before this, all of our marketing, all of our efforts, all of our behavior change was targeted at students. But one of the things that we discovered during this pandemic was that mothers were a very key gatekeeper. Um, as soon as the pandemic struck, we started reaching out to mothers in large numbers through SMS campaigns and through notifications and started having conversations with them. Using mothers as a gatekeeper and an enabler for the child to learn, we found um, that Talimabad now has a very distinct and very different pattern, even though the lockdown has been lifted in Pakistan, from nine o'clock every morning um, to about 12 to 1 p.m. in the evenings if the child isn't going to school, or from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. in the evenings if the child is going to school. There is a very structured kind of learning that is happening even through, uh, through ed tech products. And we think it is largely due to the fact that parents have now come to realize that this is the new normal. 
or at least the fact that they will have to to work with this and we find that um, young mothers have particularly adjusted well in the sense that they know that if they can get their children uh, the appropriate windows within which to learn and to support them this doesn't require that they sit with their children all the time but the fact that they're enabling their children to be learning within these times possibly by sacrificing some of their own screen time uh, shows that i think there's there's quite a lot of behaviors that are changing so usage has peaked behavior patterns among users have changed uh, parents have started to play a huge role in teaching uh, as a teacher myself i think everybody's a teacher and i think what one, one of the things that we've done is that we we've, we've started to enable mothers started to give them ways in which they can they can teach their children well and so that's been one of the key takeaways i think even when the lockdown is lifted and 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 you know there will be a time in the near future when this will be a long distance memory i think we will still be using some of the same strategies because i think they've told us of some of the most important levers to drive uh, learning outcomes for children and that's within the family of the child um nishan over to you thank you amrik uh, well first of all i want to thank the lakshmi mittal and family south asia institute at harvard for organizing this very um, timely and relevant uh, conversation we are now 7 8 months into the covid crisis and uh, many organizations working on um, education globally uh, not just in south asia have pivoted uh, in these 7 um, 8 months and have uh, a lot of learning uh, on how to uh, uh, make sure that there is continuity in in learning for for children so i think this is a very timely um, timely discussion uh, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of of this panel uh, aif's learning and migration program uh, by definition of course works on education of children from migrant communities and as you said uh, one of the biggest stories coming out of india in the covid time was the migrant crisis because millions and millions of migrants uh, migrant workers decided to move back to their villages um and therefore the learning and migration program became extremely extremely crucial uh, in the covid uh, times there are two things of course we have seen one is that covid has had a disproportionately high impact on the underprivileged uh, children uh, which is obviously the focus of our program and then it has also kind of in a very stark way exposed the digital divide that exists uh, within india and uh, you know just to kind of give you statistics there are about 1 million public schools in india in which about 200 million children go every year and only about 20 20 25% of these schools have computers and i'm not even going into how well these computers are used so there is a huge divide that existed before covid but covid has just exposed it uh, in a dramatic way there are three ways in which uh, broadly uh, children's learning in 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 these uh, very um, underprivileged communities in remote rural parts of india very underserved communities has happened one is of course the loss of instructional time in in a school setting leading to deficiency in terms of learning outcomes the second one is challenges in terms of teacher preparedness uh, to support digital learning so when we often when we talk about um, you know remote learning and digital learning we kind of focus a lot on the product on the technology on the connectivity part and kind of uh, under um, emphasize the the importance of human capital right uh, the teachers at the last mile and how well they are equipped and trained to impart uh, digital learning and of course in the context like india and maybe it is similar in other south asian countries as well where schools are also a very important source of nutrition because of mid day meal schemes uh and because of school closure uh it has had adverse impact on the nutritional security of children so we launched ai have launched our covid-19 relief work in late uh, march uh focused of course on life saving interventions like providing ration kits and hygiene kits to underprivileged communities that we work with uh but soon we move to uh ensuring continuity of education Uh, for children and in these last 6 months or so we have worked with more than 1000 children uh, about 3400 uh, teachers across about 2500 schools uh, and believe it or not um, using more than uh, 2000 um, uh, youth uh, volunteers about 45 citizen educators and 15 more than 1500 whatsapp groups and as i think harun was saying um, 
it has become uh, more from a you know good to have desirable to more essential um, you know part of your education uh, uh, work you know the use of uh, digital education and as a result we have now forged a partnership a large partnership a non commercial partnership with Baiju which is world's largest edtech firm um, and with tech companies like Dell like IBM like Mastercard to make sure that ICT is very well integrated uh, despite the challenges of hardware and software and things like that at the last mile in some of the most uh, remote uh, uh, remote parts of India. Uh, one last thing I want to mention, I think Harun touched upon that, is it's very important as we move towards a slightly different model of this community participation. Often, you know, if you look at the more by penetration uh, statistics, um, you know, we feel that it's not so much there, but what we have learned through uh, online surveys is that mobile penetration in rural areas is a very kind of interesting thing where the phone in the family, there's only one phone in the family, but it is shared between five or six members of the family. And uh, when we did, did a survey uh, um, uh, with about 4,400 parents across 12 states of India, we found that on an average parents were willing to share uh, their mobile phone with kids for education for up to two hours. And that helped us design uh, our education intervention uh, for the COVID era. So lots of uh, new learnings, lots of new insights for us. Uh, and we are building on that to kind of figure out the next phase of, um, of our programming, education program as the crisis continues. Thank you, Nishant. Um, uh, and now, Rumi, to hear from uh, your experiences in, in Nepal. Uh, thanks, Amrik. Um, the education system in Nepal it depends uh, heavily on uh, traditional ways of teaching. And I think COVID has really challenged this existing structure. And um, there's just been a huge need for a mindset shift and a resource shift to digital innovation. And as Harun and uh, Nishant were talking about, you know, while the pandemic has created difficulties in uh, different levels in our education sector, it has really forced us to be open uh, to opportunities and be more acceptable uh, to change. So uh, my organization had started in like an online uh, learning platform back in 2013. And while it got a lot of uh, attention being something that is novel, uh, but in reality, you know, folks were just not ready for it. Now with the, the pandemic, I feel like parents and teachers are very, very open to uh, new innovative ways. And um, for me, for example, you know, my, my uh, five-year-old daughter is taking online ballet uh, lessons and uh, you know, my son is learning b-boying online and I would have never, never thought that you know, I would put them up for online classes for dance specifically. But um, you know, the pandemic, pandemic sort of uh, pushed me towards that. And, and um, innovation is, uh, in education, I think is uh, more than just um, than using the technology as I think Nishant was also talking about. You know, it's, it's actually, you are solving a um, real problem in a very, very simple way that could help uh, promote equity and uh, improve learning. And um, Katha for Nepal is a very simple idea. And um, I'd just like to add that, like, you know, unlike uh, the other panelists here, uh, my organization is, um, is a fairly new and it doesn't have a history of um, really engaging with uh, in kids for uh, a long time. But um, uh, Katha for Nepal was uh, solely started after the lockdown in Nepal in um, in uh, April, and it's a it's a, a small it's a very simple idea where we're looking at you know cultivating a reading culture for young children. And Nepal uh, still struggles with uh, promoting the concept of uh, reading culture for children. And um, we want to sort of capture the willingness of people for digital media right now and see if we can improve learning. Um, in addition to this, we've we've kind of also realized that you know we could partner with uh, a number of local organizations and also globally to um, bring in a diverse range of uh, open stories um, through read aloud uh, to kids in Nepal. So, you know, it could be touching on representation, uh, talking about, you know, marginalized, um, uh, really touching on marginalized communities as well. So um, there are uh, a lot of um, uh, different uh, local organizations who are doing great work. And we recently did um, read alouds for a project with um, Let's Read Asia and a, an organization called uh, Srijanalaya, where they had launched, you know, 20 picture uh, books in Tharu 
Tharu language, and Tharu is an ethnic uh, group in southern uh, Nepal and um, in northern India. So overall, I, I feel like the uh, the pandemic has uh, opened up has also opened up a lot of opportunities for collaboration and um, resilience in the way we kind of work together uh, and to experiment new processes to engage children. Thank you, Rumi. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Ayaz, uh, it'd be great to hear lessons from Bangladesh as well. Sure thing. Uh, thank you very much for including me in today's discussion. Um, since uh, nationwide lockdown was introduced back in March, of course, all of our physical classroom activities have been uh, seized. So uh, all our learning programs now delivered online through platforms such as Zoom and uh, other live platforms. Uh, this has exposed uh, issues that we knew previously a lot of since a lot of our beneficiaries since the lockdown have moved uh, back to their home districts or the home villages internet accessibility has been a huge problem so that's a challenge that uh, we need to work on but we've also been seeing another side of this since moving all our training online we see a lot more participation for beneficiaries that are from different parts of the country who could not uh, be part of our programs before because they were not based in Dhaka so this is sort of accelerating um, an approach that we were taking to delivering our learning before, which is we are leaning more towards a blended online first method uh, where more and more of the content is being delivered through online videos with uh, sort of live sessions. Uh, right now, there would be online live sessions, perhaps in the future we'll go back to physical classes, but we still are looking to sh uh, shift as much of the content as possible into a video format and reduce the amount of instructor time to increase accessibility. Since we work with the um, uh, impressional development, we also sort of change the uh, content, what we're teaching. So preparing young people for the future of work, which is gonna be very different from how things used to be done. So preparing young people for uh, online collaboration, working with remote teams and things like that. And the experience of the pandemic has also been a very strong reminder that we need to develop certain traits in our youth. So uh, working on resilience and adaptability as things continue to be uncertain for a long time. These are things that we are also introducing as core parts of our programs. Thank you, Ayaz. Um, I want to I wanted to turn our attention um, to 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 a different uh, to a different lens. And um, it's, uh, I, I couldn't help but notice that uh, on a panel of education and innovation in, in South Asia, um, all our participants came from the non-state sector um, and from, from the non-profit sector. Um, and many of the, um, the solutions and the pivots that you discussed um, also rely um, on the private sector in some form. Um, so Nishant, you talked about partnership, uh, partnering with Microsoft. Harun, you talked about um, the private solutions that are rooted in, in, in bargains within in the family. Um, and But I wanted to, to, to talk about um, the the state uh, in South Asia, um, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, and India, and and what role the public sector had um, in either uh, supporting, building upon, or expanding uh, efforts that um, and innovations that all of you are making. Um, do you um, do you see some sort of role for the public sector? And if so, what is the role of the public sector um, in supporting or expanding or building upon the uh, the work that all of you are doing? Um, let's start with uh, Harun again. I think one of the most interesting things that we've seen so far is that um, traditionally uh, ed tech solutions or the which whatever uses technology has always been, I think it's been on a on a low priority for the state sector because some of the reasons that have already been described on this call, smartphone penetration or technology penetration continues to be low or was low uh, up, at, up until a few years ago, uh, especially in the communities on which the government focuses on. So in, at least in Pakistan, for example, uh, uh, private schools will often exist in a price range that might be completely inaccessible to the kind of people that the government is focusing most of its attention on, which are out of school children. And so I think one of the things that the government has come to realize this time around is that um, in the pandemic, I think we've really seen uh, how technology has the potential to be used for a wide variety of things. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Um, the first is that television has always been the state's uh, medium uh, to disseminate information. 
uh, Pakistan has a state broadcaster that has over 95% penetration all across the country, even in small towns and villages. It is a free-to-air terrestrial uh, network. Uh, if you have an antenna in any part of Pakistan or a small device, you'll be able to catch it. Most of Pakistan's cricket matches will be streamed on it. Most of Pakistan's uh, news about what the new crop disease is and how to avoid it will also be aired on this uh, on this medium. I think the government um, realized when the pandemic hit, there was literally no other possible way to be reaching these children. Uh, and, and this even surprised us because in, within the span of, and kudos to the government in Pakistan for doing so, I'm pretty sure Nepal and, 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 and other governments did the same as well. Um, but within 14 days, not only had Pakistan pulled out all the resources, but it had also launched, launched a free to air dedicated TV channel. It had pulled together all the players from the private sector who had contributed uh, content, which was, you know, sequenced and had learning progression built in. And that content started to be aired on national television and went out to an audience of about 10 million children. Uh, I think this was about 14 days from the pandemic. That's, that's blitz speed. Uh, for state institutions to be acting on, on something of this sort. But I think what we've seen th throughout the pandemic is that um, states do remain open to the possibility. Uh, it is unfortunate that, you know, uh, such a scenario might uh, sort of propel action from the state to explore innovative models by which education uh, can be delivered. I'm not saying that because they broadcast, uh, you know, content on national television for eight hours a day that they've solved most of the pressing crisis that Pakistan faces in terms of enrolling out of school children. But I think that one of, the, one of the things that this has really started off is that it's kicked off a debate about what could be possible. If we can't build uh, 10,000 schools by the next uh, year, uh, what do we need to do in order to get to these children? And that might not be TV, that might not be mobile phones, but I think that one of the really interesting things is whether it's WhatsApp groups or some other things, the state is now becoming open to the possibility that this might be done on a protracted long-term basis. There's already, you know, uh, 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 a policy group that has been formed by the government um, and big, you know, uh, donors like the UNICEF and World Bank are coalescing around this, uh, this entire issue. My sincere hope is, that once we discover a vaccine and 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 you know uh, hopefully solve this this pandemic for good, that we don't roll back on the fact that we thought about all of this in an innovative fashion, but in fact that we considered all of the models that we just discussed in this meeting. Um, that there are there are new ways to reach these children. For now, the state seems to be incredibly open, incredibly proactive, almost acting like a startup um, in terms of how quickly they mobilize. Um, our hope is that. It sustains as well and, and gets translated into post-pandemic gains too. Um, that is great to hear that the that the, the the state in Pakistan has been so open um, and acting like a startup, as as you say. Um, uh, Nishan, it'd be here. It'd be great to hear from uh, from you about how how you you see the the state across the border in in India. Absolutely, I think this is a very good and relevant question, certainly for for AIF because. Um, we work only with the government uh, across our entire education work because you know the scale and complexity of the challenge that we are um, trying to address is just so huge that the only way to achieve sustainability and 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 scale is to work with the government. Um, you know there are a lot of details here, but the, we don't have time, so I'll give you I'll give you a philosophical answer. I think you know the civil society organizations, NGOs like AIF and many others, uh, you know, the, the big advantage we have is the agility and flexibility. A lot of our resources are unrestricted um, and, and, and that allows us to do innovation, that allows us to bring best practices, that allows us to build the capacity of government, uh, you know, uh, teaching a community at the last mile. Um, whereas government brings, uh, you know, exceptionally high levels of resources and outreach. So I kind of don't see this as a, you know, NGO versus government kind of equation here. I see it as an ecosystem where government is a stakeholder, NGOs are a stakeholder, and I would include many other uh, actors, including private sector, for example, right? And I think what we need is to build a culture of dialogue, demonstration, and documentation and a kind of platform to convene all the stakeholders together. I mean, I was giving you the example of the partnership that we have forged with Baiju's, which is world's largest ed tech firm, which will allow us to take uh, Baiju's uh, high quality standardized um, content in multiple languages 
to really under-resourced um, uh, government schools, 10,000 government, government schools across India. And so you basically leveraging government resources, government um, uh, you know, capacity at the last mile, leveraging resources of the private sector, and then using your position to kind of convene these uh, players together. I think that is the only way um, to, and although I, I think it's also kind of unfair to say that there is no innovation happening in the government. Uh, within the government, there is a lot of innovation happening. In India, for example, there is something called as Atal Innovations Lab. I think the challenge is, uh, how do you take these innovations from these labs to, um, to the last mile in some of the really remote rural parts of India? I think things are significantly better in the larger cities, but how do you take them to communities? How do you translate them uh, for a, 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 a student-friendly experience um, in communities which are where you have first generation learners. And so I think those are kind of challenges that civil society organizations are very well equipped to deal with in partnership with the government. And there is a lot of receptivity. You know, we have, we, we have MOUs with multiple state governments uh, in India. Interestingly, the new national education policy in, the, in, in India was actually la launched uh, end of July, which is in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, that recognizes the use of technology. That also recognizes um, the role of civil society in education. And that uh, also, uh, in a very kind of specific way, it recognizes the, um, the need to invest in education of, my, of children of migrant communities in partnership with the civil society, partly because of our uh, input into the, into the policy. Uh, but partly because of the openness and open-mindedness of the government to leverage all resources of it. Um, Rumi, uh, to hear from you from Nepal. Um, sure. And um, I think as Arun was talking about how Pakistan has um, really pushed on its state television in, in Nepal, I think um, there's been some educational radio programs for children and um, spe specifically during COVID and which has been a collaboration of non-state and um, state sectors. And so there are some examples of innovation here that have gained uh, some traction and the government is even, I think the Ministry of Education had started like um, a, a web uh, um, a, a profile where you've gotten download uh, educational resources. And, uh, but the challenge I think is I think um, while Nepal um, is, has a federal structure now, the center is still um, in a, a lot of control. So, you know, we've got a history of nationalized uh, public schools and so everything is still very centralized and um, the local governments have not been able to really um, shape the education system to that extent. And that's put in a lot of um, marginalized populations in disadvantage. And I think that's why there are a lot of non-state players um, who are trying to bridge the gap and, um, and but I think there's still possibilities of being able to work in the local level and there are a number of uh, amazing organizations who've done some um, great work here in the local level to introduce different programs like in arts and literature and um, I think I feel like for Katha and Nepal for the next step like I feel like we could collaborate with uh, local municipalities to bring uh, learning through read alouds you know that could reflect um, cultural or historical stories from that local community so we can promote their you know maybe local language or our artists so I think there's there's definitely a potential um and finally as be uh, great to hear from you in Bangladesh sure um so I could actually really relate to um Harman's experience uh, here in Bangladesh almost immediately after the lockdown uh, the government began rallying all the small ed tech startups that we have and we started immediately rushing into producing videos and starting broadcast, broadcast on TV immediately. Uh, so that was very quick and that's a very commendable reaction from the government. And I should say that the government of Bangladesh has actually always been quite proactive when it comes to pushing forward the education agenda. Uh, but there are more long-term concerns. Um, number one, of course, we don't want to see the sort of energy level that we're seeing now during a crisis fade away when things get better. Uh, but one of our major concerns at BYLC is with youth unemployment, uh, which was problematic before and it's probably going to be an uh, even bigger challenge as we move forward and the economy takes time to recover. Uh, so BYLC does a lot of programs, we work with youth to try and address um, sort of the skill gaps uh, that we see uh, that basically come from 
the gap in what these young people are, are young graduates are learning in university versus what sort of skills that the employers require. And basically what we do is we're constantly in touch with private sector stakeholders. We're constantly trying to stay up to date on what sort of skills are required and what sort of job roles are being difficult to fill. And that's how we design our programs. But this is something that we feel, we hope uh, moving forward, we see the government take a much more active role in sort of accelerating the dialogue between uh, the private sector and the uh, academic sector so that our um, curriculum is more market-driven, demand-led instead of lagging behind and reactionary. So I hope that in the longer run, the government plays a more important role in sort of bringing the ecosystem together. It's easier for smaller organizations such as BYLC to innovate because we have a lot, uh, we have a much more smaller organizations with a lot less uh, restrictions. Um, but I think the role of government itself, more than just being an innovative, could be to sort of bring together and empower uh, all the different stakeholders in the ecosystem. Thank you, Ayaz. Um, I, I'm going to turn to questions from, from the audience. And, and there's been um, a series of questions that are picking up on, on, on a thread that all of you um, pulled on. Um, Harun, you discussed working in tier two and tier three cities. Um, Ayaz, you discussed reaching populations um, outside of Dhaka. Um, and all of you sort of pointed to the problems of, of, of last mile service provision. Uh, so there are several questions around this. Um, and so I wanted to, to, to combine a couple of them and ask, um, what has been most successful in reaching rural students uh, who don't have access to, to internet uh, or whose internet access might be constrained in some way? Um, what, um, what has, uh, has worked best for your, for your organizations to reach out to students that have um, uh, poor infrastructure to, to access content? Yeah, I think uh, one of the one of the interesting things. But I mean, the the first answer is pretty clear. Um, uh, we can't rely on smartphones and internet connectivity to reach the last mile. So that much we've discovered so far. Uh, TV has been one way for us to um, to sort of get the ball rolling. Um, but I would stop short of saying that you can get educated just by watching a TV television. If that was to be true, we'd stop our schools and just go to cinemas instead. And that would educate us. But it's a hard proposition to sell that TV can do the same thing. Um, one of the things that we're figuring out now is that, um, and this is again, I think at the end of the day, uh, um, in quite a whole lot of these places, internet will not do the job. Foot soldiers will have to do the job. It's called sneaker net or slipper net. Uh, but you know, this is people literally uh, from the last mile that the internet and devices are available in being mobilized to get to these places where these children are. And, and, and getting the education to them. We were just working in a place in which there were about 200 girls who were out of school for the longest period of time. And no matter how much technology we continue to throw at the problem, I think it doesn't solve it until and unless the communities are involved. Um, you know, once, uh, once we got their parents and their mothers and their fathers and, and some of the leaders in their communities involved and began to uh, also structure our, our education in such a way that it made tangible difference to them. For example, you know, a, a question that a lot of times, you know, we'll go on harvests in, 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 in Southern Punjab and we'll, we'll talk to farmers and we'll keep asking them, you know, why do you pull your kids out of school in such large numbers? And they'll keep on giving the most rational answer to us. Uh, basic economic theory, they'll say, well, we don't gain anything out of it. Um, we'll go to school for 10 years. And after that, we won't even get a job. So why should we? And that's a perfectly legitimate question. I think mass schooling became the norm. Studying the same thing became a norm about 100 years ago. But before that, you know, head schools or community schools were the norm. And they prepared you to deal with life how it was in your own village. I think one of the things that Talimabad has done really remarkably well in order to reach these last mile places is A, it has used people. Um, but the other thing is that when you're learning fractions, you learn fractions in the context of your local mithai shop where you buy your sweets. Uh, if you're learning uh, perimeter and area, you learn it in the context of how you can save space for wind breaking trees that, trees that you can plant around your farm to, to prevent soil erosion. But every bit of knowledge is actionable. Uh, you can literally walk out of the classroom and apply it the next day. I think well, one of the things that we'll always previously tried to do was we've always pursued a push model of education. Somebody has to wake you up at seven o'clock in the morning and push you to school. You know, wake up and go to your mom at seven in the morning and say, I want to go to school today. I just feel like it. Um, and so one of the things that we figured out now is that it's got to become a pull model for communities, for students. They've got to see something in it 
it's got to be i think uh, if it doesn't involve humans it's not going to work and i think one of the things even as an edtech company we're realizing now is that we're going to get to the goal that we want to get to uh, including getting the last mile we have to change what we teach and how we teach make it relevant to the people and then use people to teach people uh, no amount of screen time might ever you know uh, get around to really uh, relinquishing or vanishing that and uh, finishing that off um nishant um yeah and i think you know i mean uh, aif's learning and migration program works only in uh, remote rural areas because of the 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 community that it focuses on right and therefore all these problems that you're talking about in terms of infrastructure connectivity devices we face that two i think overarching uh, things that we have realized in the last 7 8 months one is that yes technology is very powerful it is very enabling but it cannot um, be seen as a replacement of the school based uh, learning and uh, the second thing is what harun was also talk talking about is that we have to especially at the last mile in remote areas we have to complement it uh, uh, with the use of you know he called it foot soldiers or or, or, or community itself um, which is what we have done in the last 7 8 months um there are people in the community who want to contribute and we just have to leverage that um the third thing as i said in the beginning is how do we build the capacity of the teaching community at the last mile in the use of digital tools um and so you know a kind of a hybrid model offline online whatsapp has been uh, kind of as i said uh, has been very useful because you can send material uh, tv of course is we have we have we have used tv in the past a tv obviously is not interactive so therefore uh, as harun was saying you know you can it's a one way traffic when it comes to using uh, television uh, what whatsapp allows you to have interact interaction but you know not necessarily live interaction so which which has been good because most of these kids uh, were using devices of their parents um, on a shared basis so i think you know technology is something which is going to play a much larger role than it used to before even in remote rural areas um, but we are just hoping that um, this crisis um, you know goes away soon and we can come back to more brick and mortar uh, education uh, um delivery uh, as well um medium sorry at least, in, at least in the medium term of course in the long term you know hopefully the connectivity and uh, will also improve um rumi um yeah i think uh, for kotha for nepal because we've been so um focused on um you know getting the stories out through the internet and i think a next step for us is to see how we can like get through that through um you know uh, through the radio the community radio which is huge in nepal so that's definitely one thing that we'd want to see to see to get a wider impact into and get access to the rural communities and um i think as uh, nishan was also talking about a hybrid model this is something that we could definitely look into as an potential for the future where we see you know how we can get in like the concept of um storytelling is is like a supplemental activity within um the processes or the the education processes that are intact so um definitely something that you know we've been we've been thinking about and it's 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 a tall task but um definitely doable and um we'd be looking into um a, a definitely a hybrid model that would um, work to see um it, how we can keep that interest and still like you know engage the community as well because right now you know all of our the content we are building right now is um coming in from the community so we've got people are uh, sharing stories um through the online platform though so we'd have to sort of work on to see how we can get into an offline model and finally as you have the last word of uh of the evening so please take us out all right um i think um when it comes to the issue of internet access it's very difficult to sort of solve this um, essentially infrastructure problem without building infrastructure so that is basically something that uh of course we need to work on in the long term uh but i think in the case of bangladesh 
uh, we have a very vibrant development center and there's a lot of different players on the ground uh, working on a lot of different issues, a lot of different organizations working. Uh, perhaps what we should be looking is at how we can use our existing resources or how we can coordinate better so that we can use the existing networks that are out there, how we can share resources, how we can uh, leverage existing platforms uh, instead of having different players try and solve the infrastructure problems themselves or try to address these problems themselves. Uh, there are, online education is never going to replace uh, regular uh, classroom or physical education. It's, so I think even post pandemic, uh, we'll see a blend, a blend of the two. Uh, the future of work, the future of education is not going to be like it used to be before and we should uh, start preparing ourselves for it. So, uh, I hope that in the short run, we do find ways of working together. In the long run, we do solve the problems. It's gonna be build more infrastructure, build more internet access, and uh, that we can continue with the energy that we've, uh, we've been working with during this crisis. Thank you, Ayaz. Um, Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our time uh, together today, and there are many more questions than uh, we have time for. Um, and there's a lot of excitement around the work that is being done by these four organizations and the, the innovations uh, by these four organizations. Um, so I, I encourage you to, to check out their work uh, separately from our time here together. And I hope that this has just been uh, a taste of the work that is uh, being done in the region. Um, uh, please join me in thanking all our panelists, Harun, Nishant, Rumi, and Ayaz, um, in joining us today um, and for their time and sharing um, all their work. Um, but I also wanted to thank all our audience members for joining us from many different countries across the region and the world um, and many different time zones. Um, I want to encourage all audience members to continue to check out um, the Mitzel Institute for Future Events. Um, one of the nice things about these times is that we can continue to bring people together from many different places um, like this and learn lessons from each other um, and learn lessons from South Asia. Um, and we look forward to hosting more events like this um, in, in the future. So uh, without further ado, please join me in thanking uh, the panelists for, for their time and, and their insights from across the region. Thank you, Ken. thank you, Enric, thank you, Sanjay, and thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure joining this panel, and I learned a lot from my co-panelist. It was a great opportunity. Thanks a lot. Take care and stay safe. Thanks a lot, Enric. Thank you.